Hello and welcome to Mirror Fighting One to Watch. I'm Rich Jones and this is our show every Tuesday bringing you the stories of some of boxing's rising stars. Today I'm joined by British Cruiserweight Champion Richard Riakpour. Despite only starting boxing at 19, Riakpour's already made a name for himself and he's knocking on the door of some big opportunities. He's now 30 years old but looking to kick on and make waves on the world scene so I spoke to him about his fascinating life story. Riakpour speaks with honesty, openness and clarity about his life growing up falling in with the wrong crowd and ultimately nearly losing his life when he was stabbed in the chest as a teenager. Evidently, all those life experiences have shaped the man and the boxer we see in front of us today in outside the ring. And it's a story that it was a pleasure to, to hear from him and a story I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot, for, lot more of in years to come. So this is an episode you really don't want to miss. And please sit back and if you enjoy the show, like, subscribe, leave a review and get in touch via the comments. So hope you enjoy it. And uh, yeah, let's get into it. Richard React. Uh, Richard, just want to go right from the beginning, really. Just tell me a little bit about life growing up in South East London and where you came from. So, yeah, grew up in South East London, uh, around the Woolworth, Elephant and Castle area. Hung around Peckham, Brixton, and all those kind of surrounding surrounding areas, which was pretty crazy because um, the, there was a bit of post cold Wars um, f- um, with Brixton and Peckham. So I was like, I used to go to the school, which was basically right on the um, mid, middle playing field. So it was like, this is neutral ground. But at the same time, you'd get guys from Peckham and Brixton that would come there, but they would have like um, different disagreements and different, um, you know, beef, as you call it. But um, yeah, so growing up in that area was pretty tough. You know, you needed a lot of, a lot of confidence in yourself. Um, it would. It was great to have like family members, or you know, some old older brothers or some other olders from the from the streets to kind of keep an eye out for you. Um, but me coming to the game, I didn't really have too much, too many um, people to kind of protect me from from bad things happening to me or that would happen to me in the future. So it was just a completely new, new experience. Uh, me being the first generation um, in in London, being born here. So yeah, it was it was it was pretty pretty tough, very very tough. And um, let's just say I never thought I would make it to C twenty five. I honestly didn't believe I'd I'd make it to C twenty five, let alone like thirty. Yeah, and you mentioned sort of being in the middle of that little sort of postcode war and stuff like that. I mean, as a really young kid, when do you sort of, when do you first start to realise the environment you're in? Like, what sort of things do you see that you start to realise, like, okay, you know, this is the way things are around here. Do you know what I mean? Like, what sort of early memories do you remember that sort of hit home when you were a quite young kid? One of the main things growing up in a big council estate called Aylesbury, I saw a lot of drug addicts around my area. There was tons of them. Um, normally on a Friday night you would hear people shouting and screaming you know people in, in the relationship saying I hate you never want to see you again so that was that was normal but it's only until I got a little bit older I realised that's actually not normal you know that's not a normal thing to have like drug addicts you know in, in the blocks and on the staircase injecting themselves with heroin um, but that was a norm for me and that was around the time when I would literally come out to play with my little brother, like playing football and with some of the local locals around in and around the area and having football matches but and robberies, sire, sirens every second, every single second. You know, they had I remember looking at my window one one evening, um, a golf Volkswagen just literally just sped into the area, into the drive. Everybody jumped out of the car. It was a full house, and everybody just ran. There was helicopters. Um, I found out later on that there was a, a robbery for a, um, a bank robbery actually on the Wharf Road. So that was that was unknown to me. Yeah, and you start off like you say, sort of seeing these things when you're growing up, when you're really young, and then when did you start to kind of maybe? sort of fall involved in sort of the wrong crowd or, you know, get into maybe a little bit of, of trouble? When did that sort of happen? Kind of, for me, it was around, it was around 
the end of secondary school. And the reason why I say that is because we didn't have our parents calling up. We didn't have the teachers calling up our parents saying that we're late, saying that we're absent from school. You know, we kind of had that, you know, we, we had more control. We could do what we wanted. We could, if we were to go to college and miss a day of college, there would be no phone calls being made to your house. Um, your parents wouldn't know. You're effectively at that point completely in control of your life and, and a young adult. If you want to be here, you know, it's, it's a decision that you have to make. Uh, I was, it was then where everybody else around me was dropping out of college. And I would say I was probably one of the last people to drop out of college around in times I, I dropped out around um, February um, after joining in September. And that's, that was it for me. And that's when I just started to indulge in that type of lifestyle. And, and I was just, I was just in the down, downward, downward spiral. You know, before I knew it, I was kind of deep in, before I was conscious of it. Yeah, and I guess for someone that's not been in that environment, it's hard to understand. So like from someone in my, you know, someone who obviously hasn't been in that situation, what was it that appealed about that sort of, you know, you say you sort of fall into that sort of lifestyle, obviously drop out of college. I guess when that's what you're surrounded by, it's kind of inevitable that you sort of lean that way. But for someone who's never been there, never understands what what sort of appeals about that sort of, you know, lifestyle and, and falling into that sort of thing at the time. I think one of the, one of, one of the main appeals is... For me, it was just the respect, the respect that you get from, you know, kind of being on the streets, being involved in that type of lifestyle, the power, you know, the attention from, from women, the materialistic um, things, everything was appealing to me. You know, at this, you know, going back in time, you know, as, a, as a, looking back in hindsight, I just, I didn't have any of that stuff. And I just desired it. I desired it. I wanted to know how it felt. I wanted to be able to buy what I wanted to buy at any time, anytime I wanted to. And that's what kind of just drew me in. And I was very interested in, in that type of culture. You know, I don't, it was the films, it was the media. It was a combination of, you know, of various things. And it kind of led me it led, it led me to be kind of quite curious and that's where it started. And you mentioned earlier that there was a point where, you know, you never thought you'd make it to 25, yet alone 30. And obviously that was sort of quite close to being the case when you were a teenager. Could you just tell me a little bit about that, that night when you were 15 and obviously a, a massive moment in your life, I imagine. Oh, when I was, when when I was 15. Were, yeah. Was it when you were 15? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I, at age 15, I went to, we used to go to a lot of parties, ended up going to uh, a party with a few of my friends. And we congregated outside and we were just discussing how we we're going to go to another party. I ended up um, being approached by a guy from inside the party saying, asking for people's phones, which and we were, we were stunned. We didn't understand what was going on. Anybody that hesitated, he would stab and he ended up stabbing about three of us. I was one of, one of those three. And um, unfortunately, I suffered the, the, um, the most life-threatening um, type of stab or life-threatening injury. And I'm really, really lucky to be here. Yeah, and looking back on, on that moment now, I mean, what, what do you remember about sort of the aftermath? I guess, do you remember sort of waking up in hospital? I mean, what do you remember about the, the sort of actual situation is it one of those that is kind of a blur looking back or do you remember it quite vividly or um yeah it was just it was quite vivid I remember my friend you know just slapping me asking me to wake up you know it's like I blacked out after I was stabbed and I ended up just um waking up or passing up for a period of time and becoming conscious and looking up at my my friend and he's just literally slapping me saying, wake up, um, keep your eyes open and, you know, the ambulance are going to be here. How are you? Are you all right? Are you all right? And I remember being taken into the ambulance van after reaching the hospital. Once I got into the hospital, I literally 
was I actually woke up on the operating table. I remember that, and they were like putting some some instruments into into the side of my body. Um, after that, uh, I think they gave me more anaesthetic, and then I left. Um, I think I I woke up with my dad in the corner of the of the room of the hospital room. And that's all I can remember. I was in there for a good week and a half to two weeks after the surgery. And I, I read a piece you did with an interview you did with, you, with someone else not too long ago. And I think you mentioned about sort of changing the narrative and stuff like that. Um, was that sort of feeling something that happened quite instantly after that? Or was it not until a while later that you really started to sort of, you know, decide that life needed to change and things had to change? I think things... I feel like those seeds that were planted from that situation, I wasn't, I didn't come to the part I look for trouble. I was just young, just wanted to explore, wanted to have fun, look for girls. And I ended up um, being stabbed. At that point, I realized that I wasn't safe even doing that in the, in, in certain environments, even though I was looking for trouble, even though I was a, a good boy. And that kind of changed me but not straight away. It was a it was a process. Um, I realized that you know it got to a point where I just wanted to kind of make my my parents proud, you know, getting myself to a lot of trouble, bring a lot of stress on my family, and I did. I just wanted to take away that stress. I knew I was capable of doing it. I wanted to. I wanted more purpose in my life. I wanted to work towards something, and. That's when everything started to change ever so ever so slowly. But um eventually I, I found myself on a different path. Yeah, and you say that it changed slowly and there were sort of some of the seeds from, from the stabbing incident, but was there a moment that was like the catalyst that you know put you on that different path a few years down the line or was it just one um, of those things, a gradual process? Looking back, I think it was just a gradual, gradual process. But it was definitely stemmed from the seven. Definitely. Yeah, and you've obviously got, you know, a, a scar on your chest from it. I mean, looking back now, does that hold any sort of significance to you when you obviously look in the mirror and, and see the scar? What does that sort of mean to you? Does it does it have any meaning or is it is it kind of an irrelevance? Do you know what I mean? It's it's a reminder for me, you know, it could have been the end of me then, but I'm still here for some reason. And I'm, I'm going to make the most out of it. Uh, that's probably one of the reasons why I spread spread the story. I, I, I talk about it a lot. I've done uh, tons of in- interviews. I've just gone to so many different schools all across the UK to kind of you know persuade youth to follow their dreams, look for their purpose, try to help them find their purpose. And avoid getting themselves caught up in that type of lifestyle because it's just a waste of time and they can end up um, being just a statistic. Yeah, I was about to come on to that. Obviously, you do some great work with, you know, with kids and sort of speaking to people in schools and things like that. And um, I mean, that must be quite an eye-opening thing as well. Are there any sort of stories you come across going into the schools that have really touched you and, you know, a case of you helping them? But I imagine when you go and working with kids, it, kind of can help you as well and give you some, you know, really valuable lessons. Is there anything that's really touched you when you've been going into schools and, and speaking to these kids? Yes, of course. Absolutely. I've received a lot of messages all over social media from from students that I've spoken to or students just in the in the in the crowd and congregation. And they've told me how my my talk has has affected their lives in in ways that they never would have ma- have imagined. They told me that they were um, they were timid, shy to follow their dreams, and I kind of just gave them that kind of confidence to really pursue um, what they want to do in life. And they just they just want to thank me. I've received messages from parents, from um, you know all over social media saying, "I don't know what you said to my son." But, you know, it's, it, I've never, ever seen him like this before. I just want to thank you, you know, for what, what, what you've done. Um, is there any way I can follow you or, you know, we can keep contact and stuff. So 
you know, to receive these messages from, it's, it's really, really reward, rewarding. And it keeps me going back, you know, because it's all about, you know, it's, it's all about positive energy and, and helping other people in life. Yeah, do you think it's an issue that's maybe a bit sort of misunderstood, the, the knife crime issue? Like you say, you were just in sort of the wrong place and the wrong time, but kind of in the wrong environment. Do you think it's, obviously you go around talking about it a lot and sort of discussing it with kids. Do you think that to a lot of people it's kind of misunderstood the, the reasons for it and, and the issue in general? Yes, absolutely. I think it's, it's a very interesting subject and reason why, you know, in my case... I came, um, I'm a young boy, born and bred in London and had both of my parents active in my life, ended up um, being kind of led astray, a few individuals um, and close friends gone to the wrong places and ended up in a type of lifestyle. Now, my situation is different from other people's situations. For instance, you can have uh, a child um, coming from uh, a, a, a bad, a really, really bad environment. And when I say bad environment, in regards to maybe um, one parent missing or both parents not being in in their family and them living in hostels and foster homes and stuff like that and needing that type of love and attention or that type of family type of sense, of course, they're just going to gravitate to that lifestyle um, way sooner or far so and probably never ever leave that um, or you can have um, somebody going to a child going to school always gets in trouble not really interested in, in in school and the whole schooling process ends up getting excluded numerous and numerous amount of occasions and ends up in in one of these type of centres for excluded pupils and it's even easier to get involved because Everybody, you're, you know, you're mixing, you're integrating with, you know, effectively people from bro- broken homes, people from that environment where it's, you know, they have no purpose and nothing else to live for, no father figure, no mother that actually cares about them and wants them to kind of do good. And they just, you know, gravitate to whatever shows them love. And if it's going to be, you know, a gang, you know, that's a gang that's giving them drugs to sell, for instance, and saying this listen anything you need we we would um we'll give to you you know essentially and if you're in trouble we will be there to protect you they're going to find that very very appealing so it's all about kind of just seeing it from all these different perspectives and you know being interested enough to actually want to kind of find out the issues that are at hand and the issues that different individuals individual space yeah and nice little segue onto the fact that you talk about a lot of people sort of maybe don't have a purpose or they need to find somewhere where they're loved and you obviously fell into boxing was it about 19 years old you first stepped in the boxing gym yeah 19 and just tell me first of all how did you end up how did that come about how did you first end up going to to the boxing gym so i ended up going to the boxing gym through a close friend of mine his name is jemmy and he used to always throw combinations and he knew how to fight. I was very, very intrigued with the combination he was through. I was fascinated by um, being able to um, anticipate shots and how I would re- react. And I was really interested to to see how I would do, how I would fare up having a fight. And just boxing and learning techniques, I think um, boxing is important. It's, it's a great um, way for to defend yourself, you know, because, you know, things happen in life. And, you know, it's, it's just great to know. It's great for fitness, good for, for, for the mental. It's great for discipline. There's so many benefits that you can get out of, um, of training as a, as a boxer. So I was very interested. I ended up going to the gym for a, ser- a, a period of time. Finally, I had a fight and I started getting some good results. And I realized that I have uh, definitely a talent for it. And it was just all about nurturing that talent. And, you know, I ended up going to some championships, doing well in the championships. And people kind of advising me and telling me that, you know, this is really, this, you have an opportunity here. You're young, you started a bit late, but, 
you know, you're doing really well. So you just need to stick at it. But at the same time, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Um, which I did then take offensively for some reason because I just didn't think they believed in my 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 skill or you know in me you know, to actually become what they said I could become. But you know, I just thought you know why not you know why not do something else just in case because you know theoretically speaking, if you break your arm or your leg, have a accident, how can you compete? How can you perform? Uh, anything can happen in life. So I, I decided to take up the advice. I ended up um, studying, doing an access course and going to uni. So after I graduated, that's when I turned professional. Yeah, and you mentioned obviously the, the uni side as well. How important was that, the, you know, getting the education, going to university and how proud are you of, obviously people talk about you boxing a lot, but how proud are you of, of that side of things as well? Yeah, I'm really proud of, you know, my comp- uh, um, academic accomplishments. I honestly didn't believe I'd ever have a degree. I just, I just wasn't interested. I was, you know, I would say I was intelligent. You know, when I put my mind to, to it, I could definitely get the results and get decent grades. But I just, uni was just a, a, a kind of myth. It had this kind of mythical status, you know, being able to graduate and I could just, you know, I used to always think about the workload and it's the workload that completely put me off writing 10,000 word essays, 15,000 word essays. I thought, no, no, that's, I'm not doing that. <laughs> but I, I actually ended up doing that and, and getting a degree. It's, uh, it's funny how, how life turns out. But I think it's, it's, it's really challenging. You know, there's times where I actually believe that, you know, studying and getting a degree is actually harder than some fights. I'll tell you that. It's harder than boxing because it's, but it's different. You're working the brain and then you're working a bit of brain and and your muscles and the muscle memory and practicing over and over again. So it's it's a bit more demanding when it comes to the academic side, I'd say. Yeah, and you back to the box. And it was interesting, you mentioned a minute ago that you sort of maybe felt like people were, they said that you could do it on one hand, but you felt on the other hand, like they were sort of doubting that you could, you know, put all your eggs in, in the boxing basket. Looking back, do you think that that was maybe a little bit of, of sort of doubting yourself or do you, you know, do you think maybe a little bit it was you sort of doubting them telling you that you could do it and doubting yourself whether it was something that you could go all the way with or? I would say it wasn't about, it wasn't me down myself. I, I actually believe that they were down me and my ability to actually, you know, do well in, in boxing, you know, and I don't, you know, it's just like, you know, if somebody, if somebody really believed in you, you know, and knew to be successful in any endeavor, are they going to talk about you doing something else completely different? You know, that's just the way I took it at that time. But, you know, think about it logically, it makes a lot of sense. Like now, but I think because of my age, hearing that information there, I didn't understand. I wasn't able to fathom what they were what they were trying to trying to say. But I completely understand now. And was it Miguel's gym that you first went down to, or one in, one of your first gyms? Is that right? Or no, it was the Lynn okay. ABC. Okay, and that then, was the first yeah. gym I ever joined. Yeah, and, and then, then later on, when I, after after I turned professional, I started off at, at Miguel's boxing gym. Yeah, so who were the sort of early influences in your boxing-wise that you sort of encountered that kind of set you on the boxing path and the people that sort of shaped your early experiences in boxing? I would say... I would say it's more of of my coaches back then. I actually, you know, thinking back, I was very influenced by the boxers on that amateur though the world stage on an amateur level, I was very influenced by the Cuban fighters, the Russians. Okay. Um, I used to watch them re- religiously. Also the Kazakhs, you know, yeah. Some some other European fighters, but I was very influenced by those countries in particular. That's interesting. Not a lot of people would say that. Why was it that you were so sort of fascinated and, and influenced by those sort of fighters? And the reason why is because they were the best. They were the best in, in the game at that time. And I wanted to be the best. So 
I ended up studying the best and their fights were also very entertaining for me because it's just they made it look so easy. Uh, as a fighter myself, I knew how difficult it was. But it's, I was just able to appreciate the, the art, the science, the sweet science. Yeah, and you obviously went professional and you've, you've moved quite quickly in your professional career. You stepped up quite soon against Sam Hyde, which was obviously a tough fight at the time. I mean, is that something that, do you think your sort of life experiences have sort of shaped the way you've approached your professional career, a case of sort of now or never, there's sort of no time to waste? Or, you know, why is it that you've been so, you've been quite eager to step up, obviously Sam Hyde, you know, the McCarthy fight, Chris Billum smith you haven't been afraid to take sort of quite tricky fights on paper the last three or four times you've been out. Why do you think that is? I think my managers, you know, they put everything in perspective, you know, regarding, like, in regards to my age and, and the time I've got left. And also, you know, me as a fighter, what I do have, which is, which is power. So I always have, I always have a chance. Um, and that's one of the, you know, the blessings that I'm very thankful for. Now, it's just, it's just, it was just literally just about going in there and, and rolling the dice. You know, we, there was no security that we would come out as, as the victors in some of those fights. But, you know, it's, that's how life is. You know, you just have to, to go in there and give you your best shot. Sometimes that's, that's just enough. You know, with Sam Hyde, that's actually one of the fights that, I show at all of the primary schools and the secondary schools that I've been to. And the reason why is just to show that it doesn't matter how, how you start. It just matters how you finish. You know? And it's not good to, to give up unless it's, it's completely over. And it's, if it's not over, then keep on going all the way to the end. And when it's done, that's when it's done because you always have a chance as long as you're, you're still in it. Yeah, that's sort of answered one of my next, next questions, which is going to be, what would you sort of go back and tell your younger self now? And I guess that'd be it. It's not how you start, it's how you finish. That's a pretty wise message to sort of live by. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, you know, anything can happen. You know, I've seen, I've seen so, many, so many different fights where it was going one way and then it just turned on its head. You know, there's, that's the great thing about boxing. You know, I've seen fighters that won every single round and the last 10 seconds, 15 seconds of the fight in the 12th round ended up getting knocked out. And it just shows you that if you just carry on trying all the way, you know, giving your best, even when, you know, the chips are down, you're down on all the cards and, you know, but it's not over. You still got a little bit left. Just, just, just keep on throwing, keep on throwing. And you never know. You, know, you could end up um, being a victor in the end. And you, you touched on the time you've got left. Do you ever wonder, you know, ever think, I wish I'd, I wish I'd put a pair of boxing gloves on a little bit sooner? Yeah, of course. I always, I always um, think about how things would have been if I started early. I feel like everybody's got, got their own journey. And I think that's one of the key attributes to, to my life and my success, which people, which people are going to always touch on the first thing they always say to me when I discuss my life, my career as an athlete is, wow, you started really late, but look what you've achieved. So that's just part of my story. And I embrace it. You know, when I look at the world champions at Cruiserweight, a lot of them are like aged, they're mid-30s. And so I don't ever think about time or age anymore. You know, I believe it's all about how you how a fight or how an athlete looks after oneself that's the most important thing you have to look after yourself if you ain't looking after yourself then of course that's gonna that's gonna turn to um uh, that's gonna turn into the mileage time on the clock yeah and cruise away a, a pretty exciting division i think a couple of your recent wins against mccarthy bill and smith probably look even better wins in in hindsight after seeing some of their performances since i mean What's the, the future hold for you? Do you think you've got the British title? There's a lot of opportunities at Cruiserweight. There's, there's this talk of a new sort of bridgeweight class and obviously a lot of Cruiserweight step up to heavyweight. I mean, not getting too far ahead, what's the, the sort of dreams and, and the future hold for yourself, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, the, I'm in a, in a great position. There's a lot of opportunities that are starting to present themselves slowly but surely. All of those fights that I've taken... 
and come through in the past have, have paid off, paid um, incredible dividends. And it's, people are starting to do that now. And some I've seen some of these um, some of these young fighters and some some other fighters stepping up and then they're, they're falling just short. But it just shows how how difficult it is. But one of the great things, greatest um, things I've learned in the ring so far is I've I've learned a lot of I've I've received a lot of experience from jumping in with these guys. So I'm I'm really confident in myself to pull through in a fight, no matter how it's looking. Bridge your weight, I can easily compete at that weight um, no problem I think I'll be really dominant in that division cruiserweights obviously we're still here and heavyweights I reckon I'll still be able to to move to heavyweights and get some good good knockouts so you know it's just it's all about just laying the foundations and seeing what opportunities present themselves in, in the future but I'm very confident that I'll go through these these opponents no doubt yeah, I guess it is quite easy to sit there and say when you've had these sort of fights where you've stepped up and you've come through with wins that more fighters should do it. But do you think even hypothetically, if you might have, like the Chris Billum Smith fight, for example, was a, a pretty tight fight. Do you think even if hypothetically the decision might have gone the other way, that, you know, the, the fact that you've taken these fights have ultimately made you a better fighter in, and, you know, you've learned a lot from the experience and you would have learned more even from... a it maybe if that scorecard had gone the other way, you would have learnt more from that than if you'd fought, you know, a journeyman and, and just padded the record. Absolutely. You know, there was just, you know, you won't learn from, from a fight that's not challenging. You will not learn anything. It's better that you just hit the bag. Honestly, hit a heavy bag. You probably get more out of that um, condition in the body. But yeah, I've learnt so much from that. I think on, on that scorecard, it was close, really close. It was like one round on one and a few rounds on the other. And Terry O'Connor scored it, scored it to um, CBS. But you know, there's a lot of um, controversy around Terry O'Connor. So, you know, a lot of people don't re really respect his judging. But, you know, you know, it is what it is. When I watched the fight back, it was, it was pretty clear, you know, who was in control of that fight. But, you know, I think, you know, maybe we can do it again in the future, you know, with uh, a lot more on the line. I'm happy to, to, to do it all again and get the W. No problem. And, of course, but, stand, yeah. Yeah, and obviously standing there with the, the British title belt and all the other things you've, you've done the last few years, looking back, when you look back to sort of where you were sort of when you got stabbed or when you were a kid and stuff like that? Is it hard not to think that, you know, you've kind of already already won at this point with, you know, how far the journey's come? Is it hard to kind of not think that I've already achieved so much? And, you know, is it hard to keep yourself motivated to, to go on to more? Or? No way. I'm, I'm, I'm hungry every single day. I'm like a, a starving kid. I just flipping, just came off the boat from Africa. Like, I'm hungry. I'm trying to, listen, I'm trying to, um, you know, create a legacy out here and I've never never been satisfied with anything that I've achieved but in fact I don't think about it. I just think about you know what's next what's next and how can I cement my legacy even further um, and that's probably one of the one of my key attributes you know I just I want to do more I want to I want to do so much more you know and uh, that's the mentality of a winner you know it's just it's just like, it just reminds me of uh, Michael Jordan, you know, the last dance. I don't know if you watched that. Yeah, I've watched it. It's that great. type of mentality yeah. that you have to take on to re relentless mentality, you know, cleaner mentality. And that's that's how we live. I've sacrificed. I sacrifice anything I have to to achieve what I need to achieve. And that's why people are scared to fight React Pool. You know, the midnight train. <laughs> And finally, what do you think your younger self would, would think if they were, you know, looking at you now, if a younger you, you know, I don't know, 10 years old, 12 years old, could, could look at you now, what do you think he'd be thinking? Um, I think he'll be shocked. <laughs> My younger self looking at me now? Yeah, yeah I think it'll be, it'll, it's, it's, it's crazy. It's, I think it's been a crazy journey. I would never have been able to predict that this is how my life will turn and this is what I would be doing now. More year deal with Adidas, boxing on, you know, a platform that I actually dreamed of boxing on Sky Sports, working with the best promotion, promotional company, Matchroom. You know, what more 
could one want. You know, I'm very grateful. And your family, I guess, as well, must be be pretty proud. Yeah, my family, my family are really proud to see the journey. I think it's it's been really interesting for them as well, to, like seeing from where I came from. And uh, you know, I've, I've I've spoken a lot over you know media and stuff about my life, but not in the true truest depth of exactly what it is and in, in great detail. But I plan to release a book. In the, in the future, which I'm writing now, and um, probably shoot a, a documentary or film in the future. But um, it's it's going to be it's going to be interesting to kind of just look at everything that's happened and stuff to from seeing me and from a certain position and to where I am now. I think it's going to be um, yeah, great great information in the future for for people. Yeah, you mentioned the documentary in the book, and is it is it quite strange to think of yourself as someone that inspires people like obviously it's been an inspirational journey but is it quite strange to sort of come to terms with the fact that you've got a story that can can inspire people and and, and can sort of you know hopefully change lives for for the next generation yeah it's very strange it's it's very strange and you know it took me a long time to come to terms with that because it was it was a story that needed to be heard and i didn't want to just put my life out there, you know, in, in the public. But it, then I realized how much um, people, how, how rewarding it was, how many people, how much people benefited, benefited from it, from hearing the story. And it, it got me a lot of um, opportunities, a lot of opportunities. So I, I, I continue doing it and, um, and hopefully on a, on a bigger scale. It's funny because I, I was on YouTube um, not too long ago and I actually saw a, a video of me in 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 a, some foreign language. I didn't know what language it was, but it's actually it was in uh, North Korean. And basically, they did a, a video of me, kind of just telling my life story, edited it, showing pictures of me. Everything actually, was, I was like, "What? The fuck is this? That's crazy! That is absolutely crazy!" But but it's good. It just shows that you know, you know, stories are what people love. You know, people love to follow athletes and people that have had these crazy um, stories where they had to overcome so much adversity to get to where they have gone. And it just, you know, it's just, it's inspirational. You know, and it helps other people in their lives and in achieving, achieving their, their dreams. So it's good. Yeah, certainly an inspirational story and one that I'm, I'm sure will inspire a lot of people. It's been great to sort of get into it with you. I've really enjoyed talking to you. So thank you very much, Richard. It's been great. Yes, thank you very much.